Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. This is Jeremiah's J Man Minerva, J Man Speaks, coming to you live and direct from our world headquarters here in Rochester, New York, with a special guest. A special guest, the man, the myth, the legend. His name is David Knox, folks. Let's give him a round of applause and bring him up with us. There he is. <laughs> Mr. Good Knox. morning, J Man. How, How are you? Um, I'm real, doing very well. Real pleasure and an honor to have you on with us today. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, so why don't you quick introduction for the folks who may not know you. Maybe they've been hiding out in a cave or haven't <laughs> been involved with real estate at all in the last 40 years. Uh, tell them a little about who you are and what you do. Uh, you're asking me? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. There was a little delay in the audio. Anyway, uh, first of all, before I do, I want to thank you, J-Man, for being on our on our videos. You've done a great job. I think we have six or seven videos. The first two of them have come up. But yeah, I've been in the business for, I don't know, 50 years. And I sold homes. I managed a uh, branch, which I hated. And then I got involved in training. And uh, I was a national training director for Merrill Lynch Realty out. And I lived in Stanford, Connecticut for a while, race cars with Paul Newman, and then started David Knox seminars in 1987. I've done 3,500 seminars in all 50 states, eight provinces and 12 countries spoken at, I think, 33 NAR conventions. So my goal is to help agents improve their productivity with integrity uh, so they can get paid what they're worth. And then uh, after the market crashed in the late 2000s, I decided to deliver as much of the training as I could through uh, video. So I started Real Estate Training by DavidKnox.com, and I've used the analogy, we're like the Netflix of real estate training. And uh, we've got, I don't know, 600 videos in there. We add new videos every month, and you are on our monthly release. But we feature top agents from around the world. Um, I do presentations and companies subscribe to it. It starts off a team, a small team of five can subscribe for 147 bucks. And then it goes up up from there. So that's what I do. Excellent. And and I always try to research kind of like like fun facts. And you, you brought it up already. So you kind of stole my thunder a little bit as far as uh, you, you mentioned racing cars. And I found, let me see if I can. Here we go this picture right here. Tell me about oh this my stud. God. This stud right here uh, in, in Watkins Glen, I think that is right right here in New York yep. State, right? Southern Park. That's right. That was Watkins Glen. That was uh, racing in the class, GT1 class. And I think that was in uh, 84, 85 Watkins Glen. And I raced Sports Car Club of America. I did 40 races with them. And I believe uh, Paul Newman was also driving in the GT1 class at that time. And he and I had paddocked in the garage. I think he was next to me. So I was chatted with Paul. He, in fact, as long as you talk racing, he's a great guy. You do anything more than that, like ask for an autograph, he's, he's out of there. But I actually learned a lot from him. He was a great, great driver. Uh, but yeah, those were some incredibly fun days racing cars. And I still do track days. I'm, I'm going on a track March uh, 12th. I'm putting my uh, Porsche GT3 on Auto Club Speedway in Fontana, California. So if anybody's out there and they want a fast ride around the track, I can take passengers. Man. Come on out, Jay, man. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, you know, I always like to bring up fun facts because so much of who we are is our past, our history has made us who we are today, right? So, like, if you can drive fast and take chances, an objection is like pff, nothing, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, why don't we get, we have some, uh, so Jeffrey Scott Stanton said, Dottie Herman said to say hello. He's uh, with Douglas Elliman. Oh, wow. Dottie and I go back to the, those Merrill Lynch days. That's when I first met Dottie and, and uh, just, it's been so much fun to watch her success over the years. She's amazing. So we have our first objection, but let's, let's start with commission. I feel like, um, and, and guys just put where you're watching from in the comments, but also put, what are your top three objections? What are you hearing again and again and again? Because if it keeps you from getting a listing or helping a buyer write the best offer possible, uh, we're here to help you. But let, let's start with the commission objection because I think as our job looks easier, right? As they're, oh, I just put a sign in the yard and then there's multiple offers and I don't have to do much. Uh, why is your fee for service so high, Mr. Knox? Tell me. Well, I've got five answers to commission objections when I go through the full seminar, and I'll do them quickly and then pick on a couple, and they would be value, difference, dialogue, net, and strength. 
first one is value. You, you're, there's no technique that I could ever teach that would get you a higher commission if you don't deliver value. Uh, you're not going to pay more for Delta if they don't have a better service than, you know, Sun Country or JetBlue. And I don't mean to throw those airlines under the bus, but what is the value? And a lot of times it's, uh, you know, showing up on time, answering the phone, dressing well, getting there to the home and interviewing the owners. And the idea on a listing presentation <clears throat> is to be so good they don't even ask you to cut. And I, I use the example of a waiter server in a restaurant. You know, you've all had experiences where the service is so good, you're bidding up the tip. You, you know, you're 20, 25, 30, you start bidding up the tip. So your goal as a realtor is to get them to bid up the tip. You know, they're going to ask you to cut, which is fine. And but I would say this, not only is it okay for a seller to ask you to cut, I think it's their responsibility to ask you to cut your fee. So put it in that category. They have every right as a consumer to, hey, what's your best fee? And uh, or the lowest fee or however they want to word that. So just know that they're thinking that. And you want to be so good that the husband and wife sneak away to the kitchen and they say, honey, what do you want to do about his commission? Well, I don't know. Your dad said to ask him to cut. I know, but I don't want to ask him. He's a good guy. Well, but if we don't, your dad's going to kill us. Do you want to ask? I'm not going to ask. You ask. You know, and they go through that and they finally come out and they say, well, we we're just wondering on your commission. Uh-huh. We we're just wondering, uh, you know, might you be a little bit flexible? And even their voice goes up and knocks <laughs> And And... Uh, and they're almost afraid to ask, but they're still going to ask and say, you know, David, we really love you. You know, we interviewed some other realtors and you've really done a great job. But, you know, they said they do it for one percent less. And, you know, that's eight thousand dollars. So that's a lot of money. And we just want to know. So that's kind of what we're thinking. And then um, and then you've got to respond to that. But let me finish my five. The next is difference. What is your difference? And there's there's two categories of difference. One is performance. Fail the list. Days on market, expiration rates, per person productivity, all those measurable like horsepower and torque, you know, how do you deliver a better product? And you better know your numbers. You, so if you're competing against another company that be, that undercuts you, you better go to their website, find their true commission plans, take a look at their sale list, days on market, look at all of that stuff. And even in a market where homes are selling for 101%, maybe you sell for 102.3. I mean, I don't care what the market is, you, you outperform that. Um, and then obviously your services, you know, drone, video, high definition, website promotion, all the stuff that you do to promote the listing. Obviously, you've got to have all those ready. Um, another person we feature on the training alongside you, J-Man, is a agent named Kelly Moy, protege of Howard Brenton. And she said, David, let's face it. If you, if you have a list of all the things that realtors do, 90% of them are the same. Especially when you take a look at the top agents in a market, they're all pretty good. You know that. In fact, you respect those other agents. You know they're good. You like doing business with them. So Kelly has two presentations. To Mr. and Mrs. Seller, here's a list of all the things that every real estate, every good real estate agent does in our market. And you're welcome to look at those after I leave. But today I wanted to present, here are the 10 things that I do differently and focus on our points of difference. And... Then the next is dialogue. In fact, maybe I'll do a role play with you, Jay man And sure. then net, you've got to <clears throat> demonstrate that you can actually net them more money. Just the way uh, you pay more for a lawyer, but they net you a better experience. You pay more for an accountant, but they net you a better uh, financial outcome. And then the final thing, number five, is strength. And that's where I say you have to have no power. Doesn't mean you have no power, but it means you have the power, <clears throat> pardon me, to say no. And that it's probably the most difficult thing to have that assertiveness and forcefulness to say, you know, Mr. Seller, I so appreciate you asking me to cut your commission. I don't do that, but you're a rock star for asking. <clears throat> so thank you. But no, I don't do that. Yeah. I'd rather turn you down now than not let you down later kind of a scenario. Yeah. But if you want to role play yeah, uh, the dialogue part of it, I'm glad to do it. And maybe you be a seller and I, I close on you and then you bring up the objection. So I'd, probably say, Jay, man, are you ready to go ahead and put your home on the market with me? Yeah, David, you know, I'd, I'd like to, but, you know, they were saying we, we need a certain amount of money to, to kind of make the move because sure. buying seems to be so expensive. We want to make sure we have the most amount of money possible. So, you know, would you be willing to kind of cut, cut your commission? You know, I do get asked that, Jay, man.
do you first of all jim first of all thanks for bringing up you're a total rock star for bringing up that's a really really tough thing to raise uh but i appreciate you do that as a good consumer you got to find out you know what's the what's the lowest commission i totally get that so seriously thanks for bringing it up now do you have another company that has offered to do it for less yeah and let's um, role play that that's it because that's kind of yeah yeah a lot so of it. it's um you know black and blue company down the street said they would they would do it for two two percent less than you well let's uh, maybe just do the one percent less or different okay, so 1%. we don't get any your viewers in trouble something like that yeah. so you do have another company that that will charge one percent less is that right j man that's correct well the, here's the good news if that's something that you want you've already got it, it sounds like you got a company that's willing to cut uh, and do it for that fee. And if that's something you choose to do, then the good news is you're going to get whatever you want tonight. You're either going to get that person at 1% less, or you can choose me if you choose that. So, so the good news is at the end of the night, you're going to get what you want. Um, you're going to break my heart if you go to the other company, <laughs> but I gotta, I'm a big boy. I'll let go of that. But you know, Jay, man, other than the commission, how do you feel about doing business with me? I mean, I, I like your, your marketing plan. I like your, you know, video marketing strategy. You talked about the social media stuff that you do, the videographer that you're going to bring. I mean, all that's great. It's just, you know, just trying to make the most money possible. Yep. I hear you. Well, then let me ask you this. If our fees were the same, who would you list with tonight? Well, Mr. David Knox, of course. Oh, good, good. Why? Why would you list with me over them? Well, all the things you talked about, all the things you, you said that, you know, the top 10 things that you do differently. And I think even some of the things that you mentioned that every good realtor should do, they don't do some of those. Uh, but I mean, in this market, do you think like all those things are going to make a difference in me making more money? It seems like you guys just put a sign in the yard and the stuff sells. Well, first of all, that's a good question. But before I respond to that, you just, Jamin, identified, you know, eight major differences between what we do and what the other company does. So do you see why our fees are a little bit higher? Yeah, I mean, if it, if it makes me more money, I, I, well, I can and, see that, yeah. Exactly, so then the question that you asked, and this is the most legitimate question any owner will ask, all these differences that I've highlighted and that you've summarized, what do you think that would do to help you sell your home for more money, least amount of time, least inconvenience, even in this good market? And we can stop the role play there because it yeah. really doesn't matter what the owner says. They're, they're right. going to say, it doesn't matter what the owner says. You do what you can do and you're going to get the listing or not get it. And if they don't, and if you decide you're going to list with the other company, I'm going to say, I respect your position. Thanks very much. See you later. And I'm out of here. I'm not going to cut. Let's just, that's not going to happen and, uh, and move on. But I hope some of what I did with you is called PAID, pause, acknowledge, isolate, discover. The first thing I did was pause. How did that feel? Even, even in the role play, how did that oh, feel? It, it was awkward silence, right? I'm like, uh, I want to fill the dead, dead air, right? Like, uh, 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 cause you just really yeah. did pause and like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. There's another company. Yeah. And kind of like, what's your point? And then A is acknowledge where you let them know you're listening. Hello, SD Perez. Uh, uh, let them know you're listening. So you'd have to acknowledge. Then I isolate, you know, other than the commission, how do you feel about listing with me? Because if you come up with another objection, like my brother's in the business or we have a corporate relocation that requires us to list with another company, well, you don't have a commission objection. So forget about it. And then D is discover or question. And the technique that I, it's such a simple technique that I don't know if agents pick up on it sometimes. And even when they do, they don't realize how important it is to practice it. And that is, if our fees were the same, who would you list with tonight? And I will, that is the most powerful dialogue I've ever taught in 50 years of being in the business, period, end of story. And I beg everybody listening, role play it over and over and over again till you get it. And people might think, do I have to role play that? Yes, you do. Cause I've done live seminars and they don't get it. And then the follow-up question is why would you list? I'm so happy that you'd list with me over the other company. Why? And they're forced to itemize all the stuff. Where do they get that? They got it in the listing presentation, which was point two in my five steps. And that's the difference. Itemizing your differences. So. Wow. <laughs> really, really strong stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like what you, what you said about, you know, being able to walk away. Cause at, at some point, there's a bluff, right? They're going like this. I'm all in, David. Either you cut it or we're not going to do business. And you have to say, well, okay. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a hard thing to do. No, no question about it is to walk away. And um, 
<clears throat> and I said to an audience the other day, you're going to have two distinct feelings. Number one is, oh my gosh, I just lost a listing I could have sold. Uh, Michael J. Williams, thank you. Thank you. Now, Michael J., I want you to role play it after that. Thank you. Uh, so two things happen at the end of this. Number one is you're going to feel uh, horrible that you lost a listing and, oh my gosh, I, I could have sold that. And you go through that. And the other thing is, my gosh, for the first time in the history of my life, I stood on principle. I stood for who I am and I stopped being codependent to somebody else. And I stood up for it. You go home and your spouse says, so how was the listing? You go, that was the best listing I've ever had. Did you get it? No, I turned it down. And by the way, I want to make a, this is really an important point. So you walk away, you didn't get the listing. People say, I, did you lose the listing? No, you chose. You made a choice to not cut your, so you don't lose the listing. You just chose not to take it at a lower fee. That's a powerful position to be. And, the, and then one more question I would ask the audience. If you decided today to, to take that position and never, ever cut again, how many listings out of 100 do you think you'd lose? And I think everybody's got to really sit down and answer that question. How many would I not get? Because you're going to lose some. Delta loses to JetBlue. You know, uh, Hyatt loses to Holiday Inn. Everybody, every brand in America loses to some other brand. They've already, that's what's going to happen. And the answer that I have gotten consistently over 30 years is 10%. I had one guy say 50%. I said, if you're losing half your listings, it's not commission. It's something. I mean, you better, you, something <laughs> horrible going on in your life. You're losing half your listing. Get in commission. So if you lose 10% of your listings, I guess the question is, are you okay with that? Are you okay with capturing 90% of the business at full fee? And then what do you do with the time that you say by not working with these 10 people that are probably going to keep cutting even after you sell it? The answer is do whatever you want. Take a vacation, you know, say hello to your family, let them know you're still alive or, you know, go get five more listings. And, and I, and I want to say this, I get that everything I've just said now is a lot easier said than done. Life is easier said than done. But at some point, you've got to just decide how do you want to run your business. And, uh, and, and it, by the way, if you cut for one client and not the others, in other words, these 10 squeaky wheel jerks, they get the, list, the, the cut and the others don't. I mean, that lacks integrity. Not everyone we're going to find out about it. And you quote in the full fee and a guy says, you come to me. On the day of my daughter's wedding, you ask me to pay full commission, yet I know you have discounted for others. Why do you right. treat me so disrespectfully? And your only answer is, I will say this one last time. I did not discount for those people. <laughs> uh, that's, that's funny. Uh, well, and, and like we what said, do you mean funny? Roll. Funny how? Do I talk? Funny how? <laughs> There's so much that's funny to you. I amuse you. I make you laugh. What's funny about it? Well, I, Sorry, I want man. you to. Um, <laughs> it's, it is really good. But the, the role play portion of it, because, you know, when I first started, I was younger in the business. I didn't really have the confidence. And that was one of the things that really helped me is having the scripts or the dialogues and then just do them again and again and again and again until you internalize it. Like you you've done this role play tens of thousands of times in your lifetime where now it's just you're unconsciously competent yeah, right so yeah. maybe re reinforce that do you do you partner up with somebody in the office do you just do it with your just anybody that'll listen right that wants to kind of play back with you yeah i th pick somebody that you know you admire trust respect that's going to give you honest feedback and not be and these role plays you shouldn't be really difficult with each other because you don't learn anything that way you start off with just let's make it an easy role play and then you know, I might say to you, Jay, man, I got a really, really tough guy tonight. I want you to beat beat me. I really want you to work me over. And you kind of tell them what level of difficulty. Yeah. But to start off, it's really about having somebody else to play off of. And then I, in our videos, we have a series called I Practice, small I, capital P, kind of take off on the iPhone. And the best role play ever is uh, if you and I were to role play, Jay, man, if I'm going to be the agent, I would give my phone to a third person and have them record it on video horizontal as close as you can get and then do a five minute video and you watch that video back and you put it on your phone so you can delete it later on because the first time you're just going to get sick watching yourself and then the second time you go oh that's better and the third time you go i think i've got it now and people say well but video is so unrealistic and it's so difficult yes that's the point 
when you can do it on video, you can do it in real life. But I will, I'll just, I'm going to go on record as saying this. The best way to learn anything is to have yourself video recorded and a role play, period. There's no other training on the planet Earth that will ever surpass that as long as you are alive on the planet Earth, period. And the problem is they think, I don't like role playing. I don't care if you like it. I re I'm tired of hearing that. Just do it. Right. And you will be better off. Looking. It's it's the old analogy, like, you know, professional, anybody who plays a professional sports, that game is won or lost in the practice, right? All the, all the times. Yeah. I was a wrestler in, in high school and college. And it was like all the repetition, really? all of that. Yeah. And, and you, and yeah. that muscle memory kicks in. And when you're actually competing, you're not even thinking about it because you've practiced so long and it's a, it, right here with the scripts let's yeah. let's get into another watching, one that came up I'm, I'm, I'm watching a show on netflix called race and it's about uh, bubba wallace one of the top first black drivers in nascar and it's a fascinating story about how he kind of broke through that and um and one of the things that he, he did obviously was a lot about you know the the racial things which was fascinating but in that when you watch that they watch the videotapes in fact uh, denny hamlin who's his crew chief and owners kind of gave him a hard time like you know, yeah, you have natural talent, but you got to go one step further. And he says, you got to watch the game films and you got to watch yourself. And they have graphs of when you went through the corner, could you have gone faster and replay the video so you can see what you do. And I do that too. I've got a, an app on my phone that I mount when I do my track days and I play that back and see how I apexed and go, Ooh, I missed it there. I was good there. So it's, you know, I do it and I re recommend others do as well. So, sorry, go ahead. You were going to ask something. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, uh, we had, Billy P. Billy from Billings, Montana, said, uh, what do I, here's her objection that she hears a lot, and, and I think this is probably common with what's going on in the market, what do I buy if I do sell limited inventory? We just did a role play on that called, how do I list without a place to buy? And I did it with my personal trainer and his girlfriend. And it begins with sitting down with a potential seller and say, if you could sell would you want to? Yes. And then you have, why would you want to sell? And then I, and they said, cause this place is too small. It's got the two of us and the two dogs. It's driving us nuts. How much longer could you be comfortable? Here? Not very long. We want to get out of here. So step number one is establish their motivation for selling. Without that, you got nothing. Step number two is you ask this question, which scenario is, is more comfortable or more difficult for you owning zero homes or two? And in this role play, they had to think in their first one, well, I don't know if we'd want to own zero, we'd be homeless. Well, not in the pejorative sense of the word, but yeah, you'd have no place to own. So you'd rather own two. And they go, yes, could you afford to? Could you handle the payments and the maintenance on all that? And they think it through, they go, oh, no, we couldn't do two homes. Plus they probably couldn't get approved for it. So now we're back to owning zero. And then you ask the question, if your car broke down today <clears throat> and the new one coming in was on that boat that sunk out in the Azores uh, this month, what would you do? Would you walk? In fact, I asked them in the role play, I said, would you guys walk? And they go, oh, no, we wouldn't walk. What would you do? We'd rent a car. Yes. That's the answer to making the move is you rent something, rent a hotel, rent another house, go to your parents. So you come up, the whole idea is interim housing. So that's number two, two A. And then instead of dealing with the emotion of, oh, where would we live? Where would we go? I say, how much would it cost you to do a double move and do interim housing? You know, five grand out, five grand in, five grand storage, 12,500 for food and hotel over six months. And it's going to cost you $25,000 to make the move. Let's quantify it. Yeah. And Harvey McKay said, if you can afford your, if you can afford to buy your way out of a problem, you haven't got a problem. So if you put it in money, say, okay, write a check and you make the move. So now how much more did you sell your home for now that since you didn't have to be uh, pressured to sell? Well, we made another 20, 30, 40 grand in the house. Now the one you buy, obviously you're going to pay premium for that too. But still, when you go to buy, now you're a cash buyer. You're going to be the one more likely to be considered. So maybe it's a break even deal, but you got what you wanted. You got a, out of this rat hole that you live in. <laughs> I wouldn't use that term. <laughs> but you, yeah, gotta, you go from the rat hole to the dream home at kind of a break even deal. And the worst case scenario is, you know, you live in a hotel for five or six months. And, you know, I think about that and I, I got to be very careful when I use this analogy because the contrast could come across wrong. But you think about, you know, the pain of living in a hotel. I'm thinking about my programmer, Stanislav Vladonyenko, who lives in the Ukraine, 
and I think I talked about him to you. He's the one who created our website and still work. He and his family have packed up and left their home. Their parents are in his place in Kharkiv. I, sorry, I can't pronounce it. It just got bombed. So, you know, when you think about what the Ukrainians are going through, uh, making a double move, you know, come on, shut up. Just just get on with it. And by the way, um, yeah. I think we for all of the listeners, if you, I think find some ways to help Ukrainians donate, do whatever you can and, and see what we can do. So I'm really worried about Sas. We talk and he's he's holed up in a in a. Uh, oh, uh, Michael J said we lived in an extended stay for three months. So, yeah, do what you have to do. But my prayers to the Ukrainians as well while we're on this call. Yeah, it's uh, my, my son's school day actually today was uh, yellow and blue day for the Ukrainians oh, okay. in support of yeah. the Ukraine. And then uh, the kids all brought donations into school. Uh, so, uh, so, so it's nice to see that they, you know, they're teaching that at the school level and, and really um, hearts out to them. They have our support. Yep. Uh, I, I love what you did with the, with like the relative story, right? Saying, okay, if your car broke down and your new car's not here yet, what would you do? And then I'm like, oh, I'd rent a car. Same thing, rent a house, because I've had multiple sellers do that, uh, even rented houses that were furnished, right? So now they just take their stuff, put it in storage, and then have it come, you know, the, the, those new climate-controlled, uh, you know, you move things or you fill them up, and then they put yeah, it in. Yeah. Makes it easy. I mean, and, and when people come back and say, well, it's inconvenient, it's painful, go, yeah, it's it's inconvenient. And what, so what's your point? What's better? Going through the inconvenience of staying in this home that you have outgrown and you can't stand it, your kids can't stand it. Really? You, you want to keep doing that? No? Okay. Well, then, you know, we have to come up with a plan B. You know, we're in a market right now where <laughs> the old move out and move in in one day, not happening. Right. So there you go, Billy. Billy P from Billings, Montana. Hey, Billy to the first world problem. So, yeah. What else should we go through, Jay, man? How about, um, I like sphere of influence uh, two different ways. So new agent, I'm calling my sphere, letting them know that I'm in the business, ready for the business. <clears throat> and then the the orphaned client, we'll call them, where I haven't talked to them in 10 years because all, all I've been caring about is building my business and I haven't kept in touch. Okay, do new agent. Uh, let's do new agent first. I just interviewed... Um, another guy, uh, right where we interviewed you, we interviewed another guy who, uh, he used to be with Target Corporation. He was a big executive. He was a buyer and then he went someplace else and he was on the other side where he was selling to Target anyway. And he decided to make a midlife career change. And, and it was more difficult for him because he had a family, he had kids in college. And I think that costs a lot. He had overhead and he made the switch. So he's a new agent. He's, you know, he's a, a mature guy in his life. Um, and I interviewed him and I said, how did you start with your sphere of influence? And he did two things that are so fundamental and so basic. But number one, he said, I sent out a letter to my sphere of influence. He sent out 400 letters and just, you know, I'm in the real estate business. Here's my company, you know, pretty standard. Every, first thing every agent should do. As soon as you learn how to pronounce the word realtor, next thing is send out an announcement <laughs> letter, you know? Right. right. And maybe, in fact, between those two, get a current photo. I look at photos of realtors in their cars and go, you don't really think you look like this, do you? Seriously? <laughs> you know, if they use that photo on the FBI 10 most wanted, you'd still be at large today. So <laughs> it, I guess it's good for that, but it's no good for marketing. Uh, and then I said, what did you do after you sent out the letters? And he said, and this is so basic, it's just embarrassing. He said, I got on the phone and I called them, all 400 of them. How long did it take you? It took me months, but you know, how long would it take you if you didn't do it? <laughs> you know, forever. <laughs> and he, that's how he started. Sent out an ask for letters, followed up with a phone call. And uh, so then the agents say, well, I don't want to bother them. Well, the opposite of bothering is ignoring. So what do you want to do? You want to bother? Right. Ignore. I don't want to do either. And I agree with you. I don't want you to do either. What I want you to do is in the middle. It's called interrupt. Uh, you can't have a relationship with another human being, personal or business, without interrupting. And uh, in Jeb Blunt's book, Fanatical Prospecting, he really banged that point. Oh, you got to interrupt somebody else. If you want to date, you got to take the risk of going up and introducing yourself to somebody. It's scary. Your hands sweat. Uh, they're for sale by owner of dating. You got to take a breath. You go up and say, hello, I'd like to meet you. And you might just flat get rejected. Well, then, That's you okay. know, as, as, uh, as uh, Brian Tracy says, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Um, 
So you get on the phone, and again, for the new age, it's say, hey, uh, this is David Knox calling. I'm just calling to see if you got my letter. Oh, yeah, we got your letter. You got in a real estate business. Boy, you are crazy to go in this market. What's the market like? And off it goes. So that's the simple way to start with current things. And along that same line, you know, I talk about five ways to con contact your sphere of influence. Thank, invite, inform, do a customer survey, and be a vendor resource. Um, but number two is invite. You can invite them out to coffee. Uh, my realtor invited me to a back to season party in Mission Hills. <clears throat> Had about 200 of his friends, relatives, past clients. I think it cost him 15 grand. But I know he made that much off of me the year I did business with him. And then where people say, well, I'm new to the business. I can't spend 15 grand. How about 50 bucks? Uh, four days later, he took me out to breakfast. He just go, hey, David, how'd you like to go out to breakfast? Sure. So it's nice. And a 50 bucks is too much. And I don't mean in that in a condescending way but if take him coffee maybe you say right. tuesday wednesday thursday my goal is to i'm going to be at starbucks at nine in the morning with somebody i don't know who and then you get on the phone call up people say hey you know i'm seeing you guys a long time how'd you like to meet for coffee starbucks at nine o'clock if you call 100 people and none of them join you for coffee the good news is you made 100 good calls inviting them a coffee and you didn't have to pay for coffee so the 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 power is in the invitation not necessarily the event so now Let's talk about the experienced agents. <clears throat> you got a five, hold 10 on, year book on, of business. So you just said yep. five things so fast. Thank, inform, <laughs> inv invite. I thought I was a fast talking New Yorker, but I, I got this guy from uh, Minneapolis. Well, forget about a New Yorker. Not, uh, I'll so take a breath. I'll take thank, a breath and go Thank, through. inform, invite. Yep. Uh, thank, you can thank your clients for their business, which I'm going to talk about next. You can invite them to an event. Yep. You could just make an information call. Yep. Um, you know, 15 second voicemail. Hey, this is David Knox, 612 590 8955. I want to let you know the market here in Rochester has done something we haven't seen happen in years. Directly affects your home. If you want to hear more about it, uh, give me a call. Here's my number again. Ready? 612 590 8955. And you blast out, you know, five of those in the morning. Uh, the next one is a customer survey, and I'm not going to get into okay. it too much, but yeah, I just, um, I just want to list them. Survey. And no, I agree. The fifth and, one. And number five is to be in this. This will tie into where I'm going to go next. You, all of you need to be a vendor resource to your clients. Uh, Bob Wolf, one of the top agents in America. I feature him in my traces. David, they can't buy from you every year. They can't list with you every year, but they always need dog sitting, gardening, pool service. They need services. You need to be their source. And he says, I've trained all my sphere of influence to call me first, no matter what they need. And agents laugh at me. You know, you get calls for trivial things. You know, you had a guy Perfect. call said, Bobby, I, you know, I have surgery and I can't get my garbage out to the street anymore. Can you help me? And Bob says, uh, Mr. Smith, I'd be happy to take your garbage can out to the street. He said, you know what? For three months, I went to Mr. Smith's house and I took his garbage can out to the street. Agents laugh at me for doing that. But you know what? When Mr. Smith goes to list his $11 million home, guess who he's probably going to call? If he right. hears a friend who wants to list a home, who's he going to call? So be their source. So all of you need to have a list of all the different resources that you use, like, trust, and respect, <clears throat> and get those. And by the way, tell the sources that you're going to refer them. That's kind of a nice connect. But let's get into the experienced agents. I, uh, I got a, one of my employees... Aaron called me, oh, this was a few years back, said, David, I need a referral to a realtor. And I said, I'd be happy to help you. And I said, why don't you use my realtor? She did a great job, the one that sold my home next door to your parents. And she said, great, I'd love to. What's her name? And I said, her name is, um... I said, I can't remember her name. <laughs> I said, Aaron, I'm sorry, Aaron, I, I got to call you back. So I go find my purchase agreement, scroll to the bottom. Oh, it's Heidi. Yeah. Okay. Heidi. So I, it's been seven years since I've heard it. It was 2011. I sold the house and it was, I think 2018 or 2019 when Aaron asked for the referral. So I go into an email, search for Heidi. I find her, I click reply on her last email. You want to guess one of my first questions? I said to her, Heidi, I was trying to refer you to my employee, Aaron, and told her how great you were. And then I forgot your name. So I had to go find the purchase agreement and look you up. And my question is, are you still in the real estate business? If you ever get to ask that question, you suck at marketing. <laughs> 100%. So she, yeah. to her credit, she emailed back kind of sheepishly. It was good to see you at 4th of July. Thank you so much for the extra effort in finding me. And then she said, yes, we are still in the real estate business. And Brian and I are still trying to find a way to connect with our past clients. <gasps> 
do you think in seven years you could have come up with an idea? Maybe you have one of these. You know, you can press the buttons and dial out. You could skywrite. You could drive by. You could fax. You could knock on the door. You could call your son to fax me in the camera to email me in the geez do something other than nothing seven yeah. years couldn't come up with a plan <laughs> Gee, come do something so to those new experienced agents i of my five things that i mentioned number one was think and this is the one thing that all experienced agents can do you will like doing it your clients will like that you did it you call them up you start with your very first buyer that you ever had and call them up and say you know, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, I, Jim, I haven't talked to you in years. And I, I don't even say, just call them up. Hey, this is David Knox. I haven't talked to you in a while. As we begin 2022, I've got this attitude of gratitude. And I'm calling to say, you know what? You were the first listing or the first buyer I ever had. And I just want to thank you because you sent me down a path of a great career. And then shut up. Just thank you for your business. They go, oh, good to hear from you. Yeah, you did a great job. Our kids loved you. How's everything going? Are you still in the real estate business? If they ask that, you know. It's a good thing you made the call. And then they might say, oh, we wish you'd called yesterday. We just listed our house. And that'll, that'll teach you. But whatever, uh, one of the nicest calls that you can make and probably should make is a thank you call. Just call them up and say, I just want to thank you for your business. And work your way through the whole list. How long it takes doesn't matter. You know, make a call one a day. And just say, I want to just call and say thank you for your business. And see where the conversation goes. And then there's two questions that realtors need to ask memorize. I'm not a fan of, fan of tattoos, but if you get one, it should be these two questions. Question number one is, how much longer do you plan to stay in your current home? How much longer? Not do you plan to list or sell? It's how much longer? Because that answer, no matter what the answer is, it's useful. If they say we're, it's a lifer, we're never going to move again. I'd like to know that. That gets into the predictive analytics that you talked about on our video. And, uh, Sorry, buddy. Wanted to say hello. Okay, buddy. Buddy! Oh, no, we lost audio. We lost audio again, David. <laughs> my dog put me on mute. Oh, I'm like, oh no, we lost audio oh, again. No, that no, no my, my buddy. You put me on mute. What, what was the last thing you heard me say? Um, how much longer? And here's Buddy. And then Buddy said, no more yeah, talking yeah. for you, Dad. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Uh, the question, is, instead of saying, do you plan to move? It's how much longer do you plan to stay in your home? Because any answer is useful. So it's an open question and time-based. The second question, the way to get a referral, instead of saying, do you know if anybody is going to buy or sell? You say, of all of your friends or of all of your neighbors, depending on the context, who do you think would be the next to make a move? And then you have to be quiet because they got to go, huh, next. Who would be next? Well, maybe Tim because he's talking about how he hates his condo. Maybe Tim. And, uh, and then take it from there. So those are the two questions you ask when it's appropriate and when you feel comfortable. So how much longer do you plan to stay in your home? Uh, typo, just uh, add the T to yeah, just put the uh, stay instead of say. You just had a typo in there. Oh, but. stay. Yeah. yeah. How am I, do you stay yeah. in your home? Do you stay? Yeah. <laughs> Still, what's say, Jeremiah? Stay. Gotcha. Fix that. Boom. Fixed it. Perfect. Here you go. Magic. Okay. All right. And, and then of all your friends or neighbors or whomever, uh, you know, J-Man, you did a great job on the predictive analytics. Uh, video on how you, instead of calling on everybody, call on the people that are more likely to move. And then you ask the question, how much longer do you plan to stay in your home? And based on using the software you talked about, the answer might be funny. You should ask. We're ready to move now. Okay. Who would be next? Who would be next to make a move? Uh, rather than buy or sell, I like to make a move. Well, even even the buy or sell is fine. Make a move, I guess, is just easier because it covers both. That way you don't... It's, I, I kind of wordsmith questions like that. I try oh, to figure yeah, out what for words sure. I, I to take out to, to make it. But it works. Just the fact that it's open question and time-based. That's the key part of it. Okay. And same thing. You know, the number one question to a buyer is, how soon do you plan to buy? So. Okay. Where are we going next, Jim man well, I hope everybody's taking copious notes, but this is being recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. And we're going to break it down to each individual 
uh, conversation so that you can internalize this forever and get the tattoos that David <laughs> instructed you <laughs> to get. Um, I think probably a, a good last one um, coming up almost on the end. Well, maybe last one expires or there's not, not a lot expiring now. Uh, what we've been telling folks is like, look for the old expires, right? Maybe ones that are on the market, 2008, 2010, 2012, 14, 16, and then cross-reference whatever hasn't been listed again and give them a call. So maybe old expires. Yeah, well, however you get to them, new, old, doesn't matter, just the fact that you go after them. And by the way, a lot of people say, well, that's old school, and they use the term old school as a pejorative to discount something that works. So I've never liked the term old school. Uh, if it works, it just works. It doesn't matter. Uh, but so let's say you come up to your list of expires, however you do it. Then the question is, how do you approach them? And um, and by the way, the reason I like agents to work expired listings, number one, these are people that they want to move. I mean, they've demonstrated they'd like to sell. Number right. two, they've also demonstrated a propensity to hire a professional. They listed with a realtor. Now, they were disappointed, perhaps, but they listed. So those are two things. And the third reason that I encourage agents to expire is because most agents won't do them. It just scares them to death. They, the thought of actually talking to another human being at a door, it, you know, they don't want to do that. In fact, I know this kind of cross is cynical, but I've said that agents today seem they'll do just about anything to avoid talking to another human being. You know, can I do it from a laptop screen without having a conversation? The answer is no. Right. Uh, and then the, the approach to expireds, I'm, I am a fan of going right to the door and knocking on the door. It, it cuts through all the junk you would have gone through to get there. You can write and call and email and post. You can do all that familiarity or just go to the door and, and just cut through all of that right away. And that may or may not be appropriate. Um, so a lot of times on expires, maybe you start with a telephone call, which it's more likely you got do not call. They got hang up on you. So I like going to the door. If it's a recent expired and the for sale sign is still there in most MLSs, even though it shows expired, the act of knocking, crossing a for sale sign and knocking on the door. I don't know what your board rules are. I know you teach yeah. for them. In a lot of cases, you can't do that, even though the sign is there, but one way or another, get to the expired. And here's the dialogue I would use. Number one, my name is David Knox. I see that your listing had expired had you intended it to do so. And then, oh, no, 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 we hadn't. Or yeah, we did. Well, let's, or let's, 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 let's role play. Um, knock, 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 knock. So you introduce yourself. Hello, um, sir. Mr. Monero, my name is David Knox and I'm with such and such realty. And I, I'm at your door today because I see that your listing had expired uh, last month. Um, have you, is it, had you intended it to happen that way? No, no, we expected to sell. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. So I okay. don't know this market. Yep, that's horribly frustrating. Um, uh, have you relisted? No, I mean, we thought we, maybe we'd just take a break and, and, and see if the market improves. I don't know. I don't know. Yep. Yeah, I hear you. Well, then I guess the, my third question to you is, is it still for sale? Well, I mean, it's not listed with an agent, no. Well, then maybe uh, maybe another way to ask the question: Do you still would you still like to sell? Yeah, I mean, if we could get our if we could get what we're looking to get out of the house, we'd be more. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Well, good. First of all, uh, just so you know, uh, having a listing expire is incredibly frustrating. I get that, uh, especially in a market like this. And uh, Mr. Manero, there's only three reasons why homes don't sell in this or any other market. And if nothing else, if you'd like, if you'd be curious to see what affected that, I'd be happy to take a look at your home, ask some questions, do a tour, sit down. And if nothing else, I'll at least tell you what I think the reason was for not expiring. Would that be helpful to you? Yeah, I know. What do you think? The three, what are the three reasons? Uh, number one is uh, marketing. Number two is condition. Number three is price. And uh, if you give me some time, we can analyze all three and see what it was. Well, you're here now. Why don't you come out of the cold? It's negative zero <laughs> here in Minneapolis. Uh, you, you came and knocked on my door. Yeah, come in. You want some coffee? Yeah. Let's talk about it. Good. So those are the, that's the simple way to do it. Number one, uh, 
you know, had you intended it to expire because they might go, oh no, number two. And the key thing, have you relisted? Because if they have, you go, oh, you're relisted. Oh, you're good yeah. to go, I'll see you later. You do not want to solicit the listing of another agent. So we want to do this with, with the code of ethics. And then number three, I asked, is it still for sale? And maybe, in fact, you helped me on maybe a better uh, script and that would be, do you, would you still like to sell? So those are the first three questions. And then kind of, you know, then you just have empathy with them. Sorry, it didn't sell. And then I think one of the ways to get an appointment with them is to say, you know, there's only three reasons why homes typically don't sell. If you'd like to know what it is. And then you go in and you sit down and then I've got a whole thing on expired, you know, ask them, why do you think it didn't sell? And we talk about the price and we walk around and we do marketing, you know, take a look at the homes. We, we talk about what the previous agent did. We take a look at the condition of the property and price. And by the way, at this point, you are very, very assertive with him. Say, so, you know, Mr. Minnesota, I got to tell you, uh, when I look at your kitchen counters, there's a lot of stuff on the counter. That, and you go through and you kind of give them some feedback. I wouldn't do it on the first walkthrough. I would wait to come back with a listing presentation. But. Yeah. So like the first walkthrough, what's your goal? Kind of build rapport, see what their pain points are, kind of. Yeah, just get to know them and uh, and then sit down and, and I've got a marketing pyramid that at the top is the sale and at the bottom is showings, MLS, video, all the different marketing we do. I say, Mr. Mister, we know we didn't get a sale, but did you get offers? Did you get feedback? Did you get showings? Did you get that? And you go through it and you find out where it broke. Now, if they come back and say, well, we had three offers. Well, you know, marketing wasn't the problem. The previous agent did everything he or she could have done. So don't throw the other agent on the bus because you couldn't do any better than he or she did. In fact, you don't throw them under the bus ever, but you might say, I see some areas in our marketing that I'd like to talk to you about when I come back, what, the things that we do differently here. And uh, and then you come back and say, you know, here's what we do differently on marketing. By the way, you know, you were asking 860,000, the highest sale price we've seen here is 424. So I think you were stretching it a little bit, <laughs> you know, and, and then you can talk about, you know, here's some things that condition we've seen in your property and buyers today really they can't, they can't see beyond condition and you go through and you say here's what we can do to get it sold would you still like to move if so let's get started yeah and i too love door knocking i door knocked before real estate and, and yeah. just like you said that's how i got through 2008 through 2009 when the market crashed it, it, it was i'm gonna come knock on your door you know why because nobody else is doing it and i can't tell you yeah. how many listings i took where they had stacks of postcards and letters and all these things that people sent because they were very passive and didn't want to hear uh, no at the door. And yep. Yep. I think getting the appointment is simple because you just wipe your feet. Can I come in? Yeah, you're there. I mean, they might as well bring you in. And I, uh, I can't remember, I think I may have mentioned this in one of the videos I did with you, but I have a pyramid where the bottom half of the pyramid is called familiarity and the top half is called direct prospecting. And familiarity is active marketing and social media and billboards, advertising, all that stuff. And it's good to do. I'm, I'm for familiarity. But the problem I see is that agents stop at familiarity and think that that's enough. No, 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 no. You got to get out of that direct prospecting, and have a conversation. So just listed card, beautiful, best form of familiarity building ever. But why not go one step further, take the card, hold it up and say, by the way, I'm David Knox. I'm the listing agent of the neighbor down the street. I want to see if you got this card. Oh, yeah, we got it. Well, this is a courtesy call to see if you have any questions. And then if you have some rapport, by the way, how much longer do you plan to stay here? And now you start using those questions, but. All right. Well, we got just, just a few minutes. If you can answer one last uh, area of concern, I think that could help agents right now in this market, especially in the larger cities is pricing the property correctly, right? If, if I have a, a half a million dollar or I'm, I'm in a million dollar market, right? New York city, you, yep. you know, Manhattan, you can't get a one bedroom walk up, no, no, no elevator, no doormat, uh, you know, 500 square feet is going to cost you a million dollars. Yep. Overpricing it in that kind of a price range by 10% could be really affect whether or not you sell. Yep. Uh, let's talk okay. about it quickly. Uh, I, I'm going to skip past all the fundamental basic parts of pricing property. Cause I assume everybody knows that you, you're going to do the CMA and the solds and the expire. You're going to do all of that stuff and you're going to come up with the CMA and you're going to, you're going to present that. But the problem is sometimes you present that people don't buy it. So my best technique that I've taught for years and years and years, and it, it can't not work. And that is to play the game called the price is right. Everybody's seen the TV show where they bring down yeah. a washer and dry. Hey, it's an all new price, you know, wash and dry. A new, a new car, a new car. It's a new car coming against the price. And you guess the price. 
And so the real estate version of the price is right is to take your seller who absolutely thinks it's worth more and say, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I appreciate, I want to get as much as I can for the property. I've done the, the x-ray of the market and this is what it shows. But I think the best way to really, really determine uh, where we should price your home is to go take a look at your competition and take them to three homes that are on the market currently for sale and you set up showings and you take them to the property and the key part of this is the most important part of this is you do not let them know the price in advance you have the feature sheet with you but you do you don't show it to them and you take them into the property and you say you know if you end up it's a 500 square foot all they do is stand in one place look around and say okay i want you to guess the price of the the asking price of this property bob what do you think it is well i think it's uh you know, a million three, 1.3. Okay, Jenny, what, what do you think they're asking? Oh, I think my husband's a little bit high. I'm going to say a million one. Million one. Is that your final answer? Yes. Well, this is actually on the market for 875. 875. Yep. You could buy this for 875. In fact, let me ask you this between this property and your property, which one would you rather live in? They go, well, kind of both of them are equal. Well, they're, that's what you're competing against. And then the next property, they guess a higher price. Finally, they, you know, they, or lower, they finally start guessing right. But that is the, there is no better way to get an owner to agree to the value. And I get the challenges. They're not really buyers. So you have to have approval of the listing agent to get that in there. We can go through all of that kind of stuff. All I'm going to tell you is that technique works. You figure out a way to make it happen. The corollary to that is the buyer game price is right. And you take the buyer to three properties that are sold, not on the market, but sold. You can't get in those unless maybe it's your company listing and somehow you can arrange it. That would be perfect. But then you just drive by. Same thing. You get in front of the house. Say, okay, Bob and Jenny, uh, this home just sold last week. was on the market for uh, six days. It had multiple offers. What do you think it sold for? And they go, oh, I think it sold for eight sixty. Bob, what do you think it sold for? I think it sold for nine sixty. dollars That's your final answer? This sold for $1.6 million. $1.6 million. What? Yep. <laughs> what? Then you take them another and another. That's how you teach people your market. And when it, once again, some of the techniques I teach are so simple that people don't get the power. I've done this, uh, my ex-fiancee in uh, Sheffield, England. I played the Price is Right game with her. As I'm I don't know anything about the market in Sheffield, but I'll drive by and I look at a, a, you know, a brownstone. I say 860,000 pounds. And she'll say, no, that's a, a, a million one. And then, then I, by the third time, I guess I know her market. And as we drive by, I go 1.2. She's right on 1.4, ah, pretty close 1.3. And I start learning the market. So if I'm her buyer, I'm far less likely to raise objections to the asking price of the one she wants me to buy. I, pro I promise you guys, these are really powerful techniques. But the problem is it takes some work. You got to put them in the car. You got to drive by, set up appointments. Awesome. Uh, well, let's... Give you a round of applause, Stu. Uh, how how can they get a hold of you and your training and your training program? Because you you do training for brokerages, for real estate boards, right? Or, or individual agents yeah. as well, right? Yeah, uh, uh, DavidKnox.com is obviously a good place to start. And then they can, you know, if you're an agent, you can take a look at our consumer videos. Uh, one that I got known for pretty well is called Pricing Your Home to Sell. We now have that online. Obviously, the DVDs, nobody does anymore. We have an online delivery. But if they're a broker, owner, manager, company, and they'd like to subscribe to kind of the Netflix of real estate training, uh, davidknox.com slash training, they can sign up for a free trial or email me, david at davidknox.com or call 612-590-8955. Operators are standing by. Uh, but if you're a small team of five or less, five or fewer, you can 147 a month. If you're an office of 25 agents, I think it's 197 a month. It's very reasonable, but, but the price of you know cable TV and they get access to all of our videos. And we also have a leadership curriculum for managers on recruiting, decruiting, coaching, training, et cetera. And I'm glad, to, happy to do a Zoom demo to anybody who would like to have a, a tour of it. Yeah, I mean, so so affordable, especially for the small brokerages that really sometimes yeah, yeah. The, the broker owner needs to be selling as well. And it's any one of these objections you've heard in the last hour can help your agents make more money, which in turn puts more money in your pocket as the broker owner. So it just makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Jay, man, this is fun working with you. And I, I want to just say again, uh, you did a really, really, really great job in our studio. We've had a lot of people come in and shoot your friend, Marky Lemons Ryle. She came in and shot and, and so many other people, but it was just fun to have you sign our green door. And then I think everything you did was in one take. 
In yeah. fact, the only time we had to do a second take is when I messed up. <laughs> but uh, well, but you did a great job, and it's it's going to be fun to see how our viewers like everything you presented. So I want to thank you for that. No, thank you. And thank all of you who are watching this, whether you're watching it live or on the playback. This is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Ask the Experts, Anything Meaningful Fridays, also known as A-Team Fridays. Uh, this is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks. Make it a great day.